Hi, everybody. Good evening. I am here to talk about land. Now, why would someone come to a conference on oceans and talk about land? Well, Randy, thankfully, just gave me an intro. And it's basically that every, that we don't, we, it doesn't make any sense to talk about land as if it's distinct from the oceans. With all of our ecosystems, it's important to look at entire cycles, not just the part that we're focused on at that point. And so we can, Am I? Okay, thank you, thank you. And so we can look at the water cycle, which includes how water moves across landscapes and through the atmosphere as a whole, and see how the way that we manage land affects the oceans. We can also explore ways to ex restore the water cycle where our actions have allowed it to, or our actions have thrown it out of balance. This is a vast topic and our time is short, so I will briefly touch on three things. Nitrogen pollution, our leaky continents, and links between forests and oceans. So nitrogen pollution, There's a lo this is a huge problem in the oceans. Um, nitrogen pollution from fertilizer runoff and sewage, and this causes dead zones, fish die-offs, and the degradation of coastal habitats that at once play an important role in filtering water and are areas of rich biodiversity. Each year, our crops, uh, about $100 billion worth of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer is dumped on our croplands. And most of this actually is wasted. It is not taken up by plants. See, the miraculous Haber-Bosch process that brought us synthetic nitrogen for fertilizer and also invoked the Green Revolution, it made nitrogen cheap. In the past, plants had to work hard to get nitrogen in natural systems. They would trade with other organisms at the root system. So um, since nitrogen fertilizers are cheap, Farmers say, well, I might as well put on plenty and make sure I have enough, and that leads to runoff. It's either volatized into the atmosphere or leached into water sources. Now, it's important to understand that our oceans aren't just sitting there soaking up nitrogen. Rather, nitrogen is taken up and cycled through microbial life in the seas. We're learning the important role that Arctic systems, in particular, play in managing nitrogen. So that's something that we can focus on. The key, as this audience would certainly appreciate, is biodiversity. Sea creatures, including those that live on the ocean floor, like clams, snails, and starfish, and worms, and those things that I can't pronounce that you mentioned, that Randy mentioned, those create space for nitrogen-eating bacteria to dwell. So there is definitely a need for a general audience book on the nitrogen cycle. Would-be authors take note. Next is our leaky continents. When we hear about water problems like water scarcity and drought and the flip side, floods, we generally think about it in terms of what does or doesn't come down from the sky. But to a great extent, these problems are symptoms of something else, that our water cycle is out of whack, most specifically due to our failure to keep water in the ground. Australian science, soil scientist Christine Jones, who's fabulous and I recommend her, her work very highly, she invites us to consider the fate of a single raindrop. Every time a drop of water hits the ground, it does one of four things. It goes up as evaporation or transpired through plants. It goes sideways as surface runoff. It goes down as deep drainage to be stored in aquifers or it is held in the soil before moving in one of the three other directions. What's crucial for ecological function, she says, 
is the length of time the water remains where it has fallen. And the problem is that too many of these raindrops that meet the ground are moving sideways. That means dragging along topsoil and whatever chemical additives have been dumped on the soil, all of which flows into our lakes and rivers and ultimately into the sea. On our landscapes, water wants to linger and slowly percolate. An important way to make this happen is to build healthy soil. In fact, it's so important, I wrote an entire book on that. Soil rich in, or I found it so important and so um, compelling and ultimately hopeful. Soil rich in organic matter, which is mostly carbon, holds onto water. When water streams onto depleted soils, it rushes away. Here is a statistic worth knowing. For every 1% increase in soil organic matter, that represents an additional 20,000 gallons of water per acre that can be held on the land. That is huge because that means that when, when you get a lot of rain all at once, that water is being held. That 20,000 gallons can be held on the ground for every, you know, give, depending on how healthy that, that soil is. And this explains why heavy rains may cause flooding on one property while not on the neighbor's land. Although, of course, eventually we are all affected by what happens upstream. Another factor on keeping water on the land is biodiversity. A diversity of plants helps maintain soil health and keep soil stable. A diversity of microorganisms maintains soil structure, creating pore spaces for water to meander. We can thank other creatures too. I like the approach of Jim Laurie. Where's Jim? Jim, Jim. Um, who is a guiding spirit of this organization, and we will hear from him on Sunday. He says that whenever he assesses a landscape, he asks the question, what is out there trying to slow the water down? It could be beaver building dams, or prairie dogs digging tunnels, or earthworms and, or beetles doing their thing. From what I learned from researching my book on water is that not only does a healthy water cycle help support biodiversity, which certainly makes sense, but also biodiversity helps to support a healthy water cycle and ensure that our landscapes are hydrated. Now for forest ocean connections. We've glanced a bit at how water moves from land to sea, but how does ocean water make its way back to land? Because this is a cycle. There is a new compelling theory called the biotic pump. Has anyone heard about the biotic pump? I guess some people, okay. So this theory puts forests at the center of this process. Okay, here's the theory in a nutshell and I mean literally a nutshell compared to how complex it actually is. So the concentration of trees in a forest means that there's a high rate of transpiration. That means that there's a lot of water that is moving up through these, through, through the, the bodies of the trees and out through the stomata of the leaves. So that high rate of transpiration creates an air pressure vacuum, basically an air pressure differential and, the, and, and an air pressure partial vacuum, whereby the forest canopy acts as a pump, drawing in moist air from the oceans. Russian physicists Anastasia Makaryava and Viktor Gorshkov, who developed this theory, describe a kind of tug of war between forest and ocean. With its abundance of trees, each busy transpiring moisture, a thriving forest evaporates more water than does the ocean. 
Thus, the wooded area wins the tug of war and pulls moisture inland where it will fall as rain. So one of the questions that they were attempting to, to answer with their work was, how does it, if, if, the, if precipitation comes from, if precipitation, the water that is precipitated ultimately comes from the ocean, it makes sense that coastal areas would get precipitation, but how does that move? How does that moisture move inland? You want to just leave it there? Okay. Are we happy with this photo? I think it's pretty nice. Thank you, Phil. I didn't realize how arduous that would be. Okay. So, so it's by the forest systems pulling the moisture in, and they've also documented cases where there has been a loss of precipitation near where there had been a lot of deforestation, for example, in Western Russia, that after there's a lot of clearing of forests, there's been a stalling and an alteration of the pattern of precipitation. My research led me to Brazilian ecologist Antonio Nobre, who sees a kinship between oceans and forests. He says the Amazon rainforest acts as an environmental regulation machine and refers to stretches of dense, extensive forest as a green ocean whose moisture, enormity, and ongoing exchange with air and wind mirrors that of its blue marine twin. Collectively, he says, the trees act like geysers, spouting a vertical river of vapor into the air that is even greater than the Amazon River. This unseen evaporated moisture is not simply lofting into the air and staying put, says Nobre. It is moving horizontally as aerial rivers along currents buoyed by wind. He notes a recent cl climatology review that identified aerial lakes that store water in the atmosphere as a kind of precipitation reserve. As Rachel Carson wrote in an essay called Clouds, up there is another ocean. I love the poetry of all this, but beyond that, when we open our understanding of water to include the water processes, infiltration, that's water moving through the landscape, transpiration, the upward movement of water through plants, and condensation, how we create clouds and ultimately precipitation falls from those clouds, these processes that link the land with the ocean, we find opportunities to manage our land in a way that benefits both land and the oceans. Within that management, biomass matters, forests matter, soil matters, and biodiversity most definitely matters. And so, as the land animal that I am, I want to give a plug to terrestrial plants. We tend to regard plants mainly as recipients of water, but they are also key determinants of where water goes and what it does. And just to link that to climate change, I love a quote by another Australian named Peter Andrews. He's kind of a maverick, farmer, author, horse breeder, you know, like your typical Australian. And um, he says, he, he talks a lot about how a lot of our problems have to do with the, remo the lack of vegetation, the removal of vegetation from our landscapes. So what he says is that plants manage water and in managing water, they manage heat. And I just think that's something really, really worth holding and, and thinking about. And I found that very inspiring. So as this weekend, as we learn more and more about the amazing realm of the oceans that we've only received our first glimpse of, let us keep in mind how land fits in because that's what we're best able to do something about, okay? 
there's a lot, we've learned some of what we can do in the oceans, but we live on land and our land can be managed in far better ways. And so let us keep that in mind because that's kind of the best way that we can have an impact on the health of our oceans. Thank you.